Good day, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for waiting for us through a little bit of technical difficulties here at the beginning. Uh, my name is Christina Louie, and I serve at Regent College as the Alumni and Church Involvement Officer. And I'm glad to host the Reverend Tish Harrison Warren, who will be talking about her new book, Prayer in the Night, for those who work or watch or weep, and to talk with us about the role of spiritual disciplines and practices which keep us anchored to Jesus when the world feels like it's turning upside down. Welcome, Tish. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're so glad to have you here. Now, this book launch conversation comes to you courtesy of the Regent College Bookstore, where you can, in fact, purchase this real live book. And it's also part of Regent's Ideas That Matter online lecture series, which is focused on cultivating theological engagement with the pressing issues of this cultural moment. And let me tell you that prayer in the night and the wisdom found within these pages speak deeply to this moment in time. In the book, Reverend Warren addresses the question, how can we trust God in the dark? And she frames her reflections around the nighttime prayer of Compline. It's an exploration of themes of human vulnerability, suffering, and God's seeming absence in the dark. Now, two things to note for our live stream audience at home. Uh, the first is that throughout our conversation, you can um, submit questions to us. You can do that by emailing questions at regent-college.edu, and we'll try to address those towards the end of our conversation. The second piece of good news is that InterVarsity Press is doing a book giveaway, and you can enter to win a copy of this beautiful book by sending a brief email with your name and mailing address to book giveaway at regent-college.edu. So that's book give away at regent-college.edu. Now, after the launch is over, the Regent College Bookstore will randomly select three lucky winners who will each receive a copy of this book, again, courtesy of InterVarsity Press. So with all of that preamble, I am excited to formally, formally introduce the Reverend Tish Harrison Warren. Tish is a priest in the Anglican Church of North America, and she has worked in a variety of ministry settings, including as a campus minister with InterVarsity, an associate rector, and with addicts and those in poverty through various churches and nonprofit organizations. She is the author of the much celebrated Liturgy of the Ordinary, which was Christianity Today's 2018 Book of the Year. Her articles and essays have appeared in the New York Times, Religion News Services, and many other places. She is a founding member of the Pelican Project and a senior fellow with the Trinity Forum. She and her husband live with their three children in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So Tish, I'm so glad to have you here. Now, um, we've had a bit of a difficult start just to this little book launch, um, but what's <laughs> To me really is that this whole book came out of a difficult season of your life and I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about its origins and why you chose to frame it around the prayer of Compline. Yeah yeah so um this book sort of begins um for me in the year 2017 um which was just it was a hard year um for us we moved from Austin, Texas, which is where I'm from, um, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So it was a cross the country move in the middle of January. And then a week after we got here, um, uh, I'm talking to you from Pittsburgh today. Um, my father um, back in Texas passed away suddenly. And then um, I flew home. Actually, it was, it, it was, his funeral was January 27th yesterday. Um, oh, and so we, um, yesterday, four years ago. So we, I flew home and spoke at his funeral on the day after, uh, which would have been today, found out uh, we were pregnant. And three weeks later I had a miscarriage. That's pretty, it was pretty dramatic. I opened the book with the story uh, about this kind of medical crazy medical complication from that. And then um, that same year <clears throat> um, became pregnant again and had a hard, long pregnancy. And in our second trimester lost our son. Um, so it was about six months of just like sadness, loss, grief. Um, there's, I've said this elsewhere, but there's kind of a, there's a type of Christian literature that, that explores real, real catastrophic loss, which is very important. It's, that's not really what this book is. Um, in many ways, 
though I experienced loss, it was, it was ordinary. I mean, my, my life is, um, average in, in many ways. I mean that in the best of ways. Um, so the things that I walked through losing a parent, moving across country, miscarriage, they're, they're fairly common. Um, but they're, but they're real. And, and part of the point of my book is that grief, that loss, that suffering is, is common to all of us, that that's um, something that we all experience in different ways. Um, not that it's evenly spread, but that it is shared um, by all of us. And so, um, so the book um, begins there, but during that time in my life, just biographically, um, nighttime became really difficult. I could mm -hmm. sort of keep going and I was going, I, I was actually picking, getting busier during the day to try to sort of avoid questions I was having, uh, avoid um, pain, uh, avoid sort of facing the, the loss and grief that I was experiencing. Then at night things would slow down. And so there was these, those empty hours would amplify all of the, the, um, loneliness, all of the grief, all the anxiety. Um, and so my response was to fill it up, to, to get distracted, to read a lot. It was Donald Trump had just been elected. So I read all, I mean, the internet was full of political commentary and I read all of it um, to be on Netflix or um, just to get, just to like distract, distract, numb. And um, so I knew, I knew I wasn't, this was not flourishing. I mean, I was staying up way too late. I was doom scrolling. I was, um, and, and so slowly um, I tried through, really through a counselor. Um, she kind of challenged me to, to let there be time for grief, let there, let there be space, let slow down. And I um, resisted, man, I, I, I didn't do it um, from and for many many nights, but slowly kind of came back to the practice of Compline, which is Anglican night time prayer. And um, I say in the book I was a priest that couldn't pray. It was a time where I just felt like my words kind of I, I there were so many unanswered questions, so many questions I knew would would not be answered. And um, and I also just felt like I I didn't in a new way kind of know how to trust God um, mm -hmm. and to trust God with myself, my own life, but, and those that I love. Um, and also sort of like looking across the suffering in the world, what did it mean to pray? And um, so I needed kind of a way back to prayer, but that I, I um, had been, there was a lot of Christian um, thinkers or devotionals that I was looking at that were just, it just felt like too tidy, too chipper, too uh, victory in Jesus, you know, and it <laughs> felt um, just saccharine and kind of, uh, it, it felt unhelpful to me. Um, and so Compline was a way, Compline, the emotional tenor of it is, is really a recognition of the vulnerability we have at nighttime. I mean, nighttime is so shaped these prayers that um, it deals a lot with mortality, with death, with the perils and dangers of this night, as it says, with our own sense of creatureliness and weariness. And so it was a way into prayer that I didn't have to sort of gin up, that I, that yeah. I could sort of throw my weight on, that, but that acknowledged the brokenness and pain in the world. Can you so, can you recite that passage for us the the one that we walk through in the book? Yeah, so Compline's a whole prayer practice with the, reading the Psalms, but that there's one prayer towards the end that I have grown to love, and I it frames the book. It's the sort of lattice that I ha I hang the whole um, structure of the book on, and it's the keep watch your Lord prayer, which is keep watch your Lord with those who work or watch or weep this night and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ, give rest to the weary, bless the dying, soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, shield the joyous, and all for your love's sake, amen. 
Thank you. Yeah, it's such a beautiful prayer. And I love the way that you, you sort of take it and, and run with every single part of it. And um, I think it's really easy for, um, for those of us who become familiar with certain words to gloss over them and um, to not hear them for what they're really saying. And that's the beauty, one of the, one of the many beauties of your book is that it forces us to actually pause and think about what are the words of the prayers that have become common. Um, and you, you also talk about faith as being more a craft than a feeling and that prayer is the chief practice in this craft. And I sort of pair that, that notion with also the fact that um, you talk about prayer, not only being about self-expression, which is how we often portray prayer in the evangelical modern evangelical world. Um, but really prayer is about taking inherited practices that anchor us and also teach us and form us. And so, so could you talk a little bit more about those two elements, though so faith as a craft and prayer as our chief practice within that? Yeah, yeah. So for when I talk about um, faith as a craft, so I just to be clear, like I don't mean it's something we do or accomplish or it's, it's somehow kind of something we earn um, uh, or, that, or that we can sort of work our way up, you know, and be better at it. Like some people are better at basketball than other people. But... Um, but what I, I do mean is that there are these habits and practices that, that one enters. If the, there are habits and practices I enter into as a writer that sh deeply shape me and whether I feel like writing on a given day or not, um, whether I feel like a writer on a given day or not, when I step into those habits and practices that are bigger than me, they, they shape me. Um, and there is a miracle in craft. I mean, I mm -hmm. bring up a quote in the book by Madeline Lingle, who says that um, that um, that there's always more of us than there's more there's more truth on the page than Shakespeare knew himself. There's more beauty in Bach than Bach was able to give. That there's something there's an overabundance in craft that it, it's more than us. Um, and yet it's something, so there's this bigger mystery that we participate in, which is what faith is about. And yet we're given these means of grace that mm. we take up when we feel like it. And when we don't, just as you would the habits of a craft, right? That you can grow in being a musician, you can grow in being a visual artist and you, you do that through time. And, and then there's flashes of insight there's things that are beyond you there's the there's um the zone right there's there's things that you participate in that are bigger than you but a lot of it is this sort of working out of these habits and practices that you're that you receive from other people that you're taught mm -hmm. and in many ways um the christian faith is the same way and so with prayer specifically i certainly um just to be clear like have i have no problem with free form or extemporaneous prayer. I pray that way all the time. We, we prayed that way for the technical issues that started this. So um, we, um, so I, I mean, really I, pr I pray that way daily. Um, but um, I think that, that, that we can, because of that, see faith as primarily about expression of our own identity or expression mm. of our own um, inner self and that is part of what prayer is. But I think maybe even more importantly, prayer is um, a long and inherited conversation with, with God, with um, the Trinity, and that we um, truly can sort of learn to pray. And, and we do that. And this is, I didn't realize this for the majority of my Christian life. I, I didn't realized that someone could sort of learn to pray that would, I don't know if that language would have made sense to me when I was maybe a freshman in college. Cause how, I mean, learning to pray, you just talk to God, like you would like your roommate, right? How, how do you learn that? But I think um, what I have learned is there's all different sorts of, there's all sorts of paths of prayer and ways of prayer that, that entering into them shape us. They move us so that, you know, throughout the church, um, Throughout church history, that they've the 
um, phrase, the law of prayer is the law of belief um, mm. has come up that, that the way that we pray is we enter it with, with kind of our small beliefs or our haphazard beliefs and, and learning to pray works back on us um, so that even when we enter into extemporaneous prayer or, or preformed prayer, we do it as different people. We've been shaped yes. by the prayers we've received. And so I think in the same way, we, we, there is a um, receiving of the habits and practices of prayer that forms us as people and that forms our communities, that forms mm. the church together. Yeah, I had a, um, I, I felt a lot of resonance when I was reading um, sort of some of your sharing of how you moved into and, and discovered more liturgical prayer. Similarly, when I became a Christian in college, I had a friend and, and she showed me this um, this writ, ancient written prayer that um, her church had given her. And I was like, why do you need that? Why can't you find those words yourself? And I think I was probably pretty fervent at the time. And it was really easy for me to find find the words to to say to God in prayer. And it wasn't until a few years later when I felt like in a lower point in my faith, when I was questioning a lot of things. In fact, it was when I was studying at Regent um, that I discovered liturgical prayer. And then I understood in a whole new way um, that I couldn't find the words because I um, was in a new place of experience and the words hadn't come to me yet. And so it was such a gift to receive words that were able to not only express what I was feeling, but to take them the next step as well and to affirm faith, even when I wasn't sure um, how much I could affirm it myself. And I, and so, um, so I love that, that you talk about that experience. And I love that you apply the language of tutor. You say that prayer is like a tutor mm -hmm. for us. Um, and I've really experienced that in my own life. Um, so thanks for just you like finding the right words to, to draw that out. Um, you know, one of the things that you talk about, you, you have a little author's note at the beginning to say that you're, you're not going to address the pandemic because you're, you're putting it to publish right as the pandemic was beginning. Um, and so I am curious, though, over this past almost year, what has been anchoring you these days? Um, have, have you relied as heavily on Compline? Are there other things that are speaking to you? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, a few things. Well, no one's asked directly about Compline. I, I'll be honest here. This is like me being kind of vulnerable. When I, I meditated on Compline for two years, I prayed this prayer every day. I wrote about this prayer. Um, and then, so for a while after I was like, I'm done with Compline for a while. <laughs> um, so I took a little break. Uh, I did, honestly, I, I was it, but I've come back to it. Um, it's been interesting. I've returned after after my break. I have I have come back to needing it in a new in a in a new way. So it was like uh, it was like I went on a long road trip with Compline across the country. <laughs> we had way too many conversations. Needed a week off, and then I could hang out with my friend again. Um, so it felt like that. So I it was more than a week, but I did take I took a break. Um, and then, um, but in terms, I mean, it's been interesting because the, um, the, the, I could have never, never imagined how um, irrelevant this, this topic would be to, to a broad swath of people when I, when I wrote it, I began in 2018 to write this book. And, um, and as you said, we, we sort of finished the, um, the, the final edits in March, it was Easter, uh, Easter tide of, of last year. So at that point we were in lockdown, but only about, it was, I think we were two weeks in. So yes. it was brand new and um, no one knew what was, it was, it was, no one knew what was, what was happening in the world. So, um, so I didn't, so Compline didn't, I'm sorry, coronavirus didn't shape the book, but certainly my experience of this book has, has deeply shaped the way that I've walked through this year and, and coronavirus. And so part of it is, I think I talk ab about grief in the book and making time for grief and space for grief and kind of what happens if we don't do that as a, as a church and as a culture. And I, I 
feel like I've seen that play out on such a broad scale, mm-hmm. just um, watching widespread grief, but also sort of widespread avoidance of grief that has resulted in all kinds of denial, but also outrage and mm-hmm. recrimination and, um, and um, political turmoil. So um, I think giving my own I have come to really see grief as a, as a Christian practice in a way that I didn't understand it as that before. So coming to see grief and lament as, a, as something I need to be more intentional about. I, I think that I would have understood grief as just, you know, you, sometimes we feel sad, um, but to be intentional about in, making space for grief, making space for lament has really shaped my response to coronavirus in a way that um, that I, I just wouldn't have thought of or known about before um, has been part of it. The Psalms, I, which I talk about in the book, have been an, a lifeline in this time um, for, for our family in general and, and me specifically. Um, prayers of practices of silence um, that I talk about in the book have been really important. That's kind of, I mean, that's always kind of my Silence is, is um, a really important thing for me generally. In some ways, I think because I'm a writer and use words so much, I, I need more silence. And so that's been um, a, a big practice for me. Um, but the book really dealing with darkness and, and suffering um, feels like it, it prepared me in some ways to to walk through this year. I mean, I know it's been a crazy year and I don't at all mean that it's been like a cakewalk here or, or that I'm like ascending from spiritual bliss to spiritual bliss. It's not been that, but, um, but I do think that, I mean, I've said this other places, but so, but that it, it, in a way that I thought was true, but maybe wasn't as true before I wrote this book. Um, my whole hope is in Jesus making all things new that, that truly like all the eggs are in that basket that um, the, and, and that the real only evidence that we have that the coronavirus, that the things like coronavirus don't have the final say is the resurrection. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so I think that there's been, um, for me, kind of a, a stake in the ground um, through through the process of, I mean, I came to this book because I, I wrote the question in the book, if we cannot trust God to keep bad things from happening to us, how do we trust God at all? Mm-hmm. And I wrote that question and I stopped writing because I didn't, I didn't have a response. I was a pastor. I'd been through seminary. I could give kind of a philosophical explanation for that but I didn't have a response that I bought, that I believed on a visceral level. Yeah. So I really stopped writing. And, and then I came back to that. I had to write my way into a response to that question. And so um, having done that work, I think um, prepared me to be able to endure, because it's certainly been an endurance, this, the, the questions and, and struggles and darkness of this year and then I'll also say just on like side note, it's not about this book, but I do think that, I mean, the liturgy of the ordinary has become very big because our for me, you know, all, all of life shrunk to the size of my house. And yes. so um, <laughs> having to meet Jesus and sort of the ordinary rhythm of life is has been essential. I miss our gathered worship. I, I really hate Zoom church so much. I hate it. I mean, we're doing it, but I hate it. And um. And so I miss, I miss embodied gathered worship. So very, very deeply. Um, but it has made the kind of ordinary liturgies of, of our day more vivid that, that I'm we're waiting in this longing for us to return together on Sundays and, and are unable to. Yeah. Well, there's so much there that I, that I want to follow up on. Um, one of the things that you you said early on was um, um, 
how you needed to take a break from Compline after, right? We, we engage these <laughs> things for so long that you need a break. I haven't told anyone that. You guys are the <laughs> only people I've told. <laughs> well, it's just you and me on the screen, but there are plenty of people watching and more who will watch later. So now you're, you've been outed, Tish. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that actually really speaks to one of the big questions that, um, that, that always come to me when I'm trying to um, push liturgical prayer, if you will, like, like encourage people is that folks who grew up with the liturgy often say to me, well, it's boring uh, or they might not want to say it's boring because it sounds unspiritual, but you know, it's, it's so something that they're so familiar with that it doesn't speak to them anymore. And, and I, and I wonder how we, in our church contexts, um, whether that's Zoom church or in person, but also in our family contexts, how do we engage some of these more rhythmic patterns and practices in a way that doesn't dull them for the yeah. people that we're giving them to and do and you know doing them with? Yeah. Yeah. So that is interesting. So I want to say, so a few sort of caveats first to respond to that. I will say like, I took a, I can, I can like hear the groans of like, um, like, like liturgics professors and, um, like, like, I don't know, like, it's like serious, you know, Anglo Catholics of me saying I took a break from Compline. Um, so, uh, because it is, it's so Protestant, right? To be like, oh, I don't like feel like doing this tonight, so I'm just not going to, or whatever. But it's a um, like I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed by that. So I I get it. Um, uh, that said, so what I'm saying is, I'm not saying that's like the right thing. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not recommending that. I was just being honest about what actually happened. Is it this book? Um, I spent so much time with Compline that it was hard to get the words of prayer in the night out of my head as I was doing mm -hmm. Compline. And so I had to sort of get to the point where I've, I've forgotten my book, you know, where it's not just, oh, oh, wait, I need to go edit that chapter. Oh, oh, I need to change that sentence, you know. Oh, oh, I forgot. I, I need to, like, you know, email back this this publisher about that, you know, like, so... Um, so some of it was my my own sort of uh, detoxing from from that becoming such a focus of my my work. But um, so I'm not I'm not recommending that. I'm just saying that's what I did. Um, but I I will say it's in some ways the second caveat is it's in some ways it's a hard question for me to answer because I didn't grow up in a liturgical mm -hmm. space and so. Um, I don't find this stuff boring. I mean, I just I find it almost endlessly fascinating. And, and for me, part of it is learning the why and the how, which I do mm. actually think would apply as well to people who did grow up with liturgy of, wait, where did this prayer come from? Why do we do this? Like, when did this start? What's the history of this? And, um, and learning all of, learning that kind of how we've received these prayers or why um, some of them, like this prayer, we don't know where it came from. You know, I mean, we can't, I, we, I, I couldn't find it. I had other scholars looking into it and, um, and, and we couldn't, so that, so that's interesting, right? Is that things sort of silently pass in and out of tradition, but also, um, like th things like Advent and Christmas and, you know, when did this start and where did it start and how did these things shape and shape up? And, um, the, the, there's, you know, a prayer in our liturgy that we use that's from the third century, like that's amazing to me. So some of it is kind of um, learn, I like to learn the sort of the history of, of liturgics and worship as well. Um, but I also just think it's fine to be bored and do things anyway. Um, I mean, that sort of like read my first book. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of that. Um, the fact is like the things of God, like we're saying God is boring, right? Like the things of God are not boring, but I do think that I, I become boring. Like my own, <laughs> my own mind is dulled. My own eyes are dulled um, so that I can begin to believe the craziness that like this, you know, episode of The Office that I've seen 47 times is more interesting 
than like the triune God of the universe. Now that's not to denigrate the office. Like, I mean, watch TV, enjoy it. Like we meet God in all of that goodness. So I'm not trying to make some kind of dichotomy here at all, but I'm, I mean, I, I experienced this with my kids too. I have, um, I have a one-year-old son and I remember when he was born, uh, especially, you know, cause we had had two pregnancy losses, just yeah. staring at him, just infinite wonder at this little person looking at his hands and his eyelashes and, um, you know, and that lasts about three days. And then you're <laughs> like, the, like parenting, Tina Fey talks about this, but it's true that something people don't tell you about parenting is it's just boring. There's just a lot of like, and especially before they talk, there's a lot of like, okay, we're like doing this. I'm like feeding you again. Like we're doing this again. Like you have no thoughts on, you know, immigration policy. Like, that's not going to come up. Like this is, this is not going to happen. So um, my point is my son's no less a wonder now than he was the second he was born. What's changed is me, right? He, he hasn't, he's just as much, which changed is my ability to see it. And so um, uh, I talk about this a little bit in the book in the, the last section, I talk about the love of God for a lot of us becomes the stale kind of phenomenon. Like, yes, you love me. Mm-hmm. Like, like my grandmother loves me. Like my mom tells me she loves me. It's fine. It's not, it doesn't capture my imagination. It doesn't capture my heart. And some of what prayer does is, is hopefully draw us back into the strangeness of this. Mm-hmm the wonder of God, the weirdness that of, of being able that we think we can actually like communicate with a divine being. Um, and, um, and this is what's amazing about, about entering the liturgy um, and with the boringness is that it will be, there's things that it's boring, it's boring, it's boring. And then boom, and something will hit you that you didn't notice before, or you'll be in a conflict with a friend. And so something about this Psalm resonates in a way that it just didn't, you know, the week before, or you hear a story on the news that's scary and anxious. And all of a sudden this, there's, there's like a reality to the life and death, dramatic, dramatic reality of life that we get numb to. So things um, can sort of, um, I think, I think, C.S. C.S. Lewis talks about right liturgy is dancing mm-hmm. and uh, that you forget the dance so that you're you can focus on the dance partner, and and that's absolutely right right like it's a, it's kind of the boring quote unquote boringness is supposed to be that we can focus on the dance partner but even that can become boring to us right like not because the dance partner isn't but because is because of our own lack of wonder, but then all of a sudden I think when we are doing this dance all of a sudden we look up and see the beauty of God in a way we didn't before. Um, Mm. And there have been times where I've thought, oh my goodness, I'm a pastor. I might've just become a Christian. I mean, this is something that I haven't seen before, right? Like this is an incredible, and and that doesn't happen, certainly doesn't happen all the time or or even often, but there, but, um, but there's, um, there's that. Now, the, the last the last thing I'd say about that is that all of this, though, I think falls under the spirit of wisdom, mm-hmm. um, not commands. Like, we need to be in scripture. We need to be in prayer, right? But the way that exactly looks, I think there's... Um, so I think we all need spiritual directors, and we all need friends and, and, and mentors and community to kind of help us um, figure, figure out what um, that might look like in a season. I mean, I think receive the practices of the church, you know, just receive them and, and, and do them. And, and it is helpful to do morning and evening prayer because that's a received practice from the church. Now there's times though, that your spiritual director or that other people may say, this isn't for you right now. You know, maybe you just had a new baby or maybe for whatever reason, this doesn't fit. I, I have a friend who's Eastern Orthodox and um, fasting is a very Mm. important practice that they just do. And it doesn't matter if it's boring or you don't feel like it, you just do it. Well, and and they're pretty intense about it. And in terms of everyone has to do it in their community, but she, she has struggled with an eating disorder. And so her priest who is their spiritual director said, like, I forbid you to do this. Like you, you won't. So the point is, 
we have these received practices from the church, but we also have community. We have mentors. We have people in our lives that can sort of help. So for particular people who grew up in liturgical traditions, um, I'm not, it, this shouldn't be sort of a burdensome thing, but I, you know, I will say, go to your non-denominational church all you want. That's eventually going to become a liturgy and boring. Like that. Yes. There, all, all forms and practices of worship are inevitably re- repetitive. Uh, I grew up in a non-liturgical space, but if I stayed home on a Sunday, I could tell you within like five minutes what's probably happening in my church service. So repetition is unavoidable. Um, well, I think that goes back to the the idea of the practices working back on us, right? Like we, we have to have that sense that they're two way. I think if we think that it's only like this thing that I have to do to check off the list of, you know, of my spiritual practice, um, then we don't see the ways and we don't invite the words to change us and to form us. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I just want to remind our audience that if you have any questions, to please email them to us to questions at regent-college.edu. And the bookstore is also taking um, your emails to book giveaway at regent-college.edu if you want to win a copy of Tish's book. Um, so please go ahead and send send your questions in and send your ballots, your e-ballots in. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about vulnerability. Um, you, you mentioned in your book that um, the word vulnerable comes from the Latin to wound. And so when we think about vulnerability, we think about the fact that we're woundable. Mm-hmm. And I kind of connect it with what you're just saying about needing to have a community around us. Um, I was at a, a webinar the other day and there was an older gentleman who shared that he, he really felt like he had not a single male in his life that he could go to and have honest heart prayer with mm-hmm. um, not a single man that he could think of. And, and, and he was older, um, you know, and I thought that that was really sad because I think it, and, and then it connects to, with me to the sort of the consumer culture that you also talk about in the book and how the culture around us wants to um, put vulnerability aside. It wants to deny our vulnerability. It wants to rush us through sadness, grief, suffering. Um, and so I just thought maybe you could expand a little more on your thoughts about what it means to be vulnerable, to be woundable, but also to desperately need people around you who may be the ones who wound you. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, the way that I talk about vulnerability in the book uh, is that, uh, so we can tend to talk about vulnerability as, as kind of emotional exposure or openness, like that person was really vulnerable and sharing that, or uh, that was a, that was a vulnerable moment because, um, she opened, she told us a secret or, and that's, that's a completely fine way to use vulnerability. That's within the lexical meaning of vulnerability. But I, what I talk about in the book it, um, more is this sort of like completely unchosen thing, whether you want to be vulnerable or not, we are able to be wounded um, in every way, physically, mentally, and, and spiritually. And so, and, and emotionally. So um I think um, when I talk about vulnerability in the book, I'm talking about this sort of deeply shared human experience um, that from the strongest of us to the weakest of us, from the wealthiest to um, the folks in dire, dire poverty, they like all of us experience vulnerability to some extent. We die. We have mortality. We cannot control the world. We experience all kinds of loss before we, before we die. Um, and so I think we spend a lot of time avoiding that. And if you have enough privilege and, um, have enough, um, you know, um, things to sort of uh, shield you from that reality, it's, it's really easy to spend a lot of our time um, kind of denying our own vulnerability yeah. or trying to fight a fight to, to sort of pretend it's not there, gussy it up. Um, and so um, I think that in the same way that in the church, that recognizing our own death, recognizing our own mortality helps us to live more more vibrantly and more beautifully. I think that um, that um, 
recognizing our inevitable vulnerability is part of how we encounter God in our, in our invulnerability, in these places of weakness. It's no surprise to God that we are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It's not, an, it's not something we need to overcome. Um, it's something that we need to recognize and, and live into embrace in some ways. Um, and so, um, uh, yeah, I think I, I quote in the book, um, uh, I think it's St. Isaac, um, the Syrian possibly, that he says, um, uh, blessed is the man who knows his own weakness. Um, and, and I think that there is a blessedness that comes from um, connecting with ourselves as vulnerable. Now, to some extent, it's like, well, all of us do that. I mean, you get up and you're, you you know, the older you get, your knee aches, and, and that's an experience of vulnerability. But I think, um, I think that we spend a lot of time um, really trying to run from the reality of our vulnerability. Um, it's, it, it's scary. It can be scary. And so, so, and yet, I mean, it is um, in suffering that we, we share in the sufferings of Jesus. And so, there is um, some kind of turn that this book calls us to of, of sitting with vulnerability and looking at it and recognizing it in ourselves um, because it, it um, becomes a place of encounter with God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, your book is really, you know, a theodicy, right? It's a reflection on suffering, trust, the problem of evil. And, um, and I think like, sometimes the odyssey, it's like, oh, it's a, it's a big word, but you, you write it with such immediacy. And um, one of the questions that, that came in was how you managed to do that. And we were talking about this a little bit before we started as well, is how every chapter you wrote, it was like you lived it um, mm -hmm. while you were writing it. And I, and so one of uh, um, my friend, Anna asked the question, how, how do you do that as a writer? How do you um, bring your theological reflection and depth um, to the immediacy of the moment? And then put it out in a book for all of us to consume, like uh, consume, not in a bad way, but you know what I mean? To take in, right. yeah. like we feel like we're walking with you right there. We're sitting with you right there. Um, Great. That's good. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> yeah. So how do I do that? Is that? Yeah. What, what, um, what do you think leads you to that, to that ability or, or. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, well, uh, yeah, I did say, I, do, I told you the story before we began that it felt like every chapter I had to live in this book in a way that I haven't with other things I've written and that was very difficult. I mean, when we, when I was writing the chapter on grief, I was grieving, um, not, not the stuff in the book that was additional stuff happening in our life that I was grieving, you know, and when, um, I wrote the chapter on work. It was one of the hardest chapters for me to write. So I was, I was having to work. I was toiling. I was experiencing thorns and thistles in my work in the chapter on work. And I mentioned this, but on the, on, in the chapter on sickness, I was in the hospital um, getting diagnosed with gestational diabetes at, in the lobby, waiting for my test results to come back, was typing this chapter on sickness and then got diagnosed with a sickness as I was writing about sickness um, to the extent where my husband and I would joke about like, don't write the chapter on death. Cause we're going to, one of us is going to die. <laughs> like we can't um, just say it. Thankfully that didn't happen, but we, it did feel like I had to sort of walk through um, weeping and watching and working and, and each of these kind of experiences as I was um writing it. I mean, I turned the final manuscript in for this book from a hospital bed um, because with uh, complications of from labor and delivery. And uh, it was so apropos for this book. Um, so uh, there, there is, there was an immediacy in my own life, like feeling these things. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think part, I, I try to write that way. I, I really, really am drawn to poetry and, and mm -hmm. books of poetry. And part of that is because poetry brings you into the mo feeling of a moment. Um, and so I want to be able to write that way. Um, so I take that as a, as a compliment. Um, 
but I'd also say um, I spend, when I first write, I just put it all in. I just, especially with this book, I just threw, I just threw in the kitchen sink. I just threw in sort of all of my thoughts. And then I spend a lot of time whittling that down. Um, probably this book started double the size that it is. And I just, I, 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 I make it small. I kind of whittle and whittle and whittle. And so um, I'm hoping, and then the other thing I'll say, this is part of it. I didn't, I didn't want this book to be about, to be like, I've come and I've had all these thoughts on the Odyssey and I've figured them all out and I've figured out how to trust God. And now I'm going to come display to you all that I have figured out. And so there's, it's not a linear, it's not a linear explanation of like a philosophical or theological subject. That's partly why I use the prayers that kind of gets me deeper into these questions. So Mm -hmm. I really came to this book asking this question. Like I said, I, I was struggling with how to trust God and um, and so this prayer was a way into my own struggles. This was this prayer forced me to think about things that I wouldn't have without the prayer. It forced me to sort of meditate or ask questions that I wouldn't have gotten to. Mm. Um, and so and I had my friend um, and, and it's Wesley Hill, because I know he's been at Regent um, and I had a lunch together early on in this process. And I remember him saying something like, yeah, just don't, you know, don't, don't make it like overly shiny in the end, like, you know, <laughs> and it all worked, you know? And so, or it's just that Christian books are like, things are hard, but Jesus is so good. And it's true that Jesus is so good, but I wanted, I, I felt like in order for that not to be a Jesus juke or a pat answer, I needed to really be absolutely honest about how dark the darkness is. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the things the church does in general that I see is that we try to focus on resurrection. We want to focus on light. And so we don't talk about death or we don't talk about suffering or we don't talk about um, the darkness enough. You see this even on Easter, you know, we want to focus on resurrection. So we don't, we, we skip over Good Friday too quickly. But I think in however well-meaning that is in denigrating the darkness, the suffering, the power of death that we experience in a daily kind of way, we end up inevitably denigrating the resurrection. And Mm. so I just had constantly in my head that I just, I just didn't want to cut corners. I wanted to be as honest as possible about the brokenness because I didn't need to defend the reputation of God. Like God has defended the reputation of God in Christ. Like that's, that is the only hope we have. So I didn't need to minimize this for God. So I, I hope that that, I hope that that, that sort of challenge, that challenge was in the back of my head throughout writing it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that um, it really comes through. Um, someone just asked a question just as you were sharing um, uh Annika, she says this, you mentioned that you have liturgies that you enact as a writer. Could you tell us more about those and how writing itself might be a spiritual practice for you, if that's true? Yeah. So writing is a huge spiritual practice for me, I would say. Um, it's, uh, yes. Um, some things I have, I don't use this all the time, but I do have a, a liturgy I received from a friend that's, um, that's kind of a prayer service before writing. And I used it a lot with this book, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I, uh, it's a, it's a, it's prayers, it's quotes, um, that I was given. Um, and I use it before this. Um, and, um, and then I also occasionally, this has been harder, um, in the last year, not just because of COVID, but because of the age of my children, but I do writing retreats um, by myself where I spend a lot of time in silence um, and a lot of time walking. Walking is an absolute essential part of the writing process for me to the extent that um, that it's been, it, it's 
it's been harder when, when, when the weather gets colder or when with COVID and there's a, like kids around and stuff, it's harder to walk, then it's harder to write for me. Um, that's a so, bit of our, about speaks to our embodiment, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And then it's totally for, I mean, there's like studies on this, that it, it helps, um, connect the hemispheres of your brain. So it helps you with creative thinking and that, and that sort of thing. So, um, but um, some other, I mean, I'm kind of embarrassed. I don't know if I should share this one. I've never shared this, but I, but I, I will. Um, I'll share this. I'm sharing, I'm being, I'm being vulnerable here with you, but I have a- Thank you. <laughs> so the, the I, I, I won't walk you through. I have a whole way that I write, like a whole, there's a, there's steps to uh, ways I write. There's a time I bring in my second reader, Marsha, um, who works with me. There's a, there's a time that I finally show it to my husband. There's a, a time I bring it to my editor. So there's, there's steps in this, but, um, but I always do a, um, several printed, like old school, like with a pencil, um, printed uh, edits, um, towards the end, I, I do edit the whole manuscript by, by reading it in print. So then I always have this manuscript, right? And, um, and so before a book really, like when I'm totally done with a book, um, I've never said this out loud, we, um, I, we burn it. We, we have, we have a, a liturgy where we, we, we um, do a fire pit in the backyard and we burn it. And the reason is that um, there's twofold in some sense, it's all going up, you know, in the smoke. And um, so it's, it's this act of prayer. Like it's like um, the incense rising to God, kind of this, the work itself is prayer, which is how I enter. That's how I write is, is I understand this as a, as a prayer in of itself. Um, but then it's also to remind me ashes to ashes, like this work itself, all of this hours, all of the struggle, it's not forever. Like it will, this book hopefully will outlive me, but it will not live forever. And there are things about it that are broken, that are not true, that need, that are going to be, need to be redeemed in Jesus. Um, and so remembering that not only am I a mortal and vulnerable creature, but that my work is mortal and vulnerable and that my work itself will, will have to be redeemed. And so um, this dual of this is worship, but, and then this is also fleeting and this is also, you know, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And so this is, um, this is something that Jesus is going to have to like, and I say this in, in all my acknowledgements is like the, um, Jesus is the word by which all of our words are judged and by which they'll be redeemed. Um, and so um, those are some, I guess, rituals and practices that yeah. I have. Thank you for sharing those. Um, we, we appreciate your vulnerability in sharing. Um, so you're a writer, but you're also um, a priest. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, how we can bring the vulnerability that is so often missing to our corporate um, either to our corporate worship or our corporate practices. Um, what are some ways that that you have found have been really fresh for drawing people into um, that ability mm -hmm. to be soft? Um, yep. and, and you talk about your husband and, and crying in the book. Um, mm -hmm. And we, how can we how can we help people find that place of vulnerability? <laughs> how can we make our congregations cry? Um, so, I mean, some of it is, of course, like le leading with vulnerability that uh, we ourselves as leaders have to be vulnerable. Um, that's tricky, right? Because you can't, as a leader, you can't share everything. And then, and you don't want your vulnerability to be completely curated. But there needs to be some people in your life that, that you, you have complete. I mean, even outside of, of your congregation where that you, that you're completely vulnerable with. I am a big believer that none of us should have secrets like that. No one knows. So we, um, we, we need to practice vulnerability in our own lives, but then I do think it's appropriate to, um, show our congregation's vulnerability to, um, to, to weep, you know, when, when, um, when we need to weep, you know, and to, um, 
and in an appropriate way. I mean, one of the ways to do this is make sure that you're not always the hero of your sermon illustrations, right? Like I, I'm actually pretty wary of, of, I, I almost n never um, share kind of the victorious moments of my life from the pulpit um, because it's um, it's off-putting to me, I think. Um, but um, stories, telling stories in a congregation, it's just, it's honestly, I don't mean even you as a leader, but getting people to share their stories, like that it's it, having having other people's stories is, is always such a uh, vulnerable thing for them, but it, it always opens up other people to tell their stories. And that's been interesting since my book has come out, I've had such great response and, and the reviewers and even people like just my readers, they'll talk about my book, but inevitably they end up sharing stories from their own life, which is great, right? Because when you share your life and vulnerability, other people will as well. The last thing I'd say is um, silence. I mean, um, gosh, like just leaving space and silence in the liturgy, people don't have it. And so people get really uncomfortable, which you may need to actually address and talk about. But if, but if you let there be some silence, the amount of people that if you leave them in a room silently without a phone will start crying is shocking um, because there's so much that we're not feeling, not feeling, not feeling, not wanting to feel distracting from that, that, that being, having to sit in silence or with some, mu you know, music in the background, there, there is, um, there, there really, it is a vulnerable thing for us. Um, and, and then just to, intentionally leave spaces for lament and openness. Um, one of the things our congregation did is they did a lament service for um, people who have experienced miscarriage, stillbirth, infertility, um, or, uh, or regretted abortions. And um, it was truly a service of lament. I mean, I did appreciate that, that, I mean, it, it, it sort of ended with trust in God. I didn't put the liturgy together for this, but that it was, it wasn't a, um, you know, let, let's get together and, and sort of have a rah-rah pep rally for Jesus in the midst of our pain. It, it really spoke, it used a lot of the Psalms, it used a lot of silence, and it used a lot of the prayers of the church, but it really left room for true sort of lament. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I think, I think that there's, um, that's, man, that's hard for me as a leader. Um, but I think creatively finding ways to do that is good. Yeah, that's great. Um, we have about 15 minutes left. So if people have questions, you can still send, I can probably take another one or two to questions at regent-college.edu. And, um, and I want to pick up on one thing that you you, you mentioned early on and then sort of um, just again now, but about that connection between trust and prayer. Um, you know, we, we come to a lament service and, and really it has to be an affirmation of trust. And when we're not trusting God, we're not trusting that he can take care of us in our vulnerability or forgive us of our sins. It's really hard to pray. Um, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about um, the connection between those two and as you've experienced them. Of, of the connection between trust, trust and, and prayer. Okay. Trust and prayer. Yeah. So I, um, I talk in the book, I don't think there's a wrong way to pray. Like there's, there's basically, I mean, the only wrong way to pray is to sort of give up praying altogether. So you can't get it wrong. So that that's nice to know, but I do think there's, there, there are, practices um can be neutral and that and that there are like even good practices like prayer can malform us if we have a vision of god where he barely tolerates us mm -hmm. or is angry at us or or is waiting for us to get better and do our duty before he responds um when we have a vision or narrative about god where we're unlovable, um, or, um, or abandoned there. I think, um, I think that, I mean, I've seen 
prayer is really difficult in that and can even sort of can sort of mal malform our spirituality. Um, so to some extent, I'm like, you know, there's just like no way, there's no, there's no practice so great that we don't need doctrine, right? There's no, there's no way around like that. We, the stories we tell ourselves, the, the, um, the way that we perceive God to be is inevitably going to shape us. Um, so how do we know what God is like and how do we know what God thinks of us? And we look at the person of Jesus, like that, that's how we, Fine. So I do think coming back to the scriptures, that's why we need good teaching and preaching. Um, and um, that practice and doctrine just constantly have to be held together. And doctrine can, when I'm saying that, that can seem like a cold word to talk about in light of talking about trust and 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 finding God loving and, and things that, you know, and then it's like doctrine. They had people like, um, but it is... Um, I mean, doc, like doctrine is, is simply um, what the, what we know is reality, like what we, how we describe reality. And even things like creeds, um, uh, N.T. Wright called creeds portable narratives, right? That these are, these are the stories we tell ourselves and, and that we, we enter into this creed as a, as a, a way to remind us of this m much bigger story, which is creation, fall, redemption, consummation, and, and we, that we find in the person of Christ. And so um, I think like we need constantly to hear the gospel. We need mm -hmm. to constantly um, be reminded of our sinfulness, our brokenness, um, but also of God's grace. Um, and I'm just more and more seeing um, the place that, how important imagination is in the Christian life. And we see this, right, with people like St. Ignatius and the Ignatian exercises are all run on imagination. Um, but I would um, say that more and more we need, we need our imagination converted as well. We, um, not just our minds, um, not just our practices, but sort of through practice, through silence, through through intentional um, exercises of imagination and entering the scriptures with our imagination. We need our imagination to be shaped by um, the doctrine that we carry in our head. And so um, what I mean by that is that we we have to constantly go back to God's love for us in Christ, God's redemption for us in Christ, that when God sees us, he sees the righteousness of Christ. Um, but that can't just be sort of cognitive. There's through our, through emotional discipleship, which I talk about in the book, sort of um, through weeping and, and watching and um, looking for God at work and also meeting God in grief but also through um, imagining God and imagining his response to us, imagining mm -hmm. Jesus um, and his, what he was like on earth. And, um, and I think we have to do that in community. We have to do that with others. Um, but, um, and, and that, as you said earlier, does open us up for hurt and for being malformed and for being told we're unlovable. Um, um, but I mean, so pick your community wisely, I would say with that as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tish. This has been, um, a really, um, wonderful time together. Um, sorry to the couple of people whose questions I am not able to get to, but, um, there have been a few requests for whether you would be willing to share your pre-writing liturgy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's not mine. It was written by a guy named Bobby Gross, who is the um, head of, he's the president of um, of graduate and faculty ministries with university. So I need to ask Bobby because I did not make this, um, but I, I can ask him and see. 
So yeah. And then if, if that is something that we can share, we'll find a way to do that connected to um, the YouTube uh, video here. Um, so check back folks in a little while. Um, so thank you so much. Um, before uh, we finish, are you working on any other writing projects right now? What do you have in the works? Yeah, I'm always working on writing projects. Uh, so I'm a columnist for Christianity Today. So I have every month write for them. Um, so I, I have to, I, I have, I should be, I have to write something tomorrow, whether I feel like it or not, this is back to the craft. <laughs> um, so uh, look for me there, but also I, my next uh, book project, um, well, there's a secret one coming up, but I'm not allowed to tell you until February. Um, so I'll just leave that as a teaser. But then, um, but then also I have, um, I'm doing a book as part of a series um, with IVP called, I think it's called The Fullness of Time. I could have that wrong, but it's a, it's a short books on each liturgical season that I'm doing with a, a crew of folks. Isa Makali is the editor. Um, uh, it's, um, I won't name all the people because I'm afraid uh, I would um, forget some of them, but, uh, uh, but we're doing each of the seasons and, um, and I'm doing Advent. So um, my next book that I need to sit down and write is on Advent and it will be coming out, I think in 2022 um, as part of this series with other, there's with other folks. So. Wow, that's super exciting. Yeah, and and um, there are a lot of themes of waiting and longing um, and expectation throughout your book, and so that seems to be seems to go hand in hand. Um, there's also a lot of Lenten themes, so I think there's a lot going on um, through prayer through prayer in the night that can connect to lots of different um, liturgical seasons. Um, and I think one of the things that I want to say before we close uh, to everybody is um, this conversation as as um, amazing has as it has been is only the tip of the iceberg of um tish's work and so i would highly commend this book to you um it was one of those books where i would underline and then underline and then i realized i'm like i've underlined the whole page so then i would be like this is silly i'm gonna stop underlining now so then whole swaths would go by where i don't underline anything and then i'm like no but this is too good and then i start doing that again so half of the manuscript is like completely underlined and the other half is not because it just felt like everything was so rich and spoke so deeply to the, the common human condition as well as to the specificity of what you were experiencing tish um and and i just yeah so i highly commend it to you um and again remind you that if you want to try to get one for free you can email book giveaway at regent-college.edu and one will be sent to three lucky winners um courtesy of intervarsity press um so tish thank you so much this has been an absolute gift um if you could share with us one favorite quote or passage from the book before we go um that would be brilliant i'm sorry i didn't give you warning that i might ask you to do that <laughs> oh no uh, is there a part that um that you particularly love <laughs> yeah i like i don't even have i i don't have the book in front of me so i'm going to have to pull it up here <laughs> It, one came to mind. So let me see. I'm pulling this up in my digital copy of the book. Um, uh, this is this is one of my personal favorite quotes from the book. Um, so I will, I'll just share. It was sort of, um, it was something I came to kind of through, through this that I would say, um, but I need to find it now on the page. Where is it? Oh, here we go. <laughs> The reason, the reason I can continue watching and waiting, even as the world is shrouded in darkness, is because the things I long for are not rooted in wishful thinking or religious ritual, but are as solid as a stone rolled away. Wow, that's beautiful. And um, it always tunes our eyes to resurrection, doesn't it? Yeah, it's um, my hope. And also, side note, please go visit the, I mean, seriously, buy the book from Regent College Bookstore. <laughs> yes, it is available um, at the Regent College Bookstore. Um, 
They are open for in-person shopping from 10 till 4. You can also email them and reserve a copy. And for our American audience, we encourage you to visit the bookstore's Aereo storefront. There's a link for that in the YouTube um, description below. Um, so, so go to them first. Uh, don't go to other big box name brand fast shipping people. Go to your small, go to your local. Um, these bookstores and um, booksellers are glue in our community. So please visit your local bookstore and in particular, the Regent College bookstore. Uh, Tish, it's been an absolute delight to speak with you. Um, to our audience at home, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for bearing with us for the first few minutes of technical difficulties. And I would commend to you um, a quick look over to the Regent College events calendar, where you will find any number of other upcoming book launches and events. We have a number of lecture series happening right now. Um, Ideas That Matter, for example, this one um, has another panel coming up on global evangelicalism in February. We have a mini series called Reading the Bible Right Now, which engages biblical scholars on how they have personally been touched or challenged by the scriptures. Um, We have the Interface Lecture Series, which addresses the relationship between science and faith, as well as a series on human flourishing in a technological age hosted by our professor Yen Zimmerman. You can find these free events and so many other things happening on the Regent Regent College events calendar. We also encourage you to check out our summer programs. All of our courses this year will be offered fully online and you can find course descriptions at rgnt.net slash summer and registration for courses opens in February. And again, deeply grateful to Tish for her time, for her wisdom, for sharing her, um, really her heart and her life with us and with all of you. And grateful for the Regent College Bookstore, which is a not-for-profit shop that directly supports the ministry of Regent College for inviting Tish here to be with us. So thank you, Tish. Thank you, audience. Thank you, bookstore. Have a blessed day. Godspeed.